Thank you, Sheila. Well, we live in a physical world, and we live in a spiritual world. And, of course, in the physical world, there are things that we can see, and there are things in the spiritual world we cannot see. Colossians 1.16 says this, For through him God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see. One of the reasons uh, <clears throat> I'd ask Sheila to sing that song was simply there was a line in there that talked about his angels that watched over us and protected us. And today I want to talk about an encounter with angels. An encounter with angels. We've encountered uh, our other um, um, what do you call it, subjects, there we go, there's a hard word to think about, uh, subjects that we've talked about, and we've had a lot of good speakers, uh, yesterday, or last Sunday, man, that guy, he could talk the chrome off a bumper, man, I came in here on Monday, Johnny, I heard his whole message again, it was bouncing off all these walls, I told him, I said, you're the wildest talker I've ever heard in my life. Uh, but we want to encounter angels today. <clears throat> years ago, my granddaughter, she was four years old. She's now a freshman at Liberty University, so that tells you how long ago it is, was. And so that would be 14 years ago. My daughter was going through a very dark time, a dark time of just some depressions, depression, an anxious feeling, anxiety, panic attacks, the whole nine yards. And one afternoon, she was sitting on her bed there in her bedroom, and our granddaughter, Sydney, said, Mama, you're going to be okay. And my daughter reacted to that, thank you. She said, I see that angel sitting next to you. And she said, you can see the angel? She said, four-year-old, nothing to prove, nothing to gain. I see the angel circled all around you well that afternoon my daughter read in her sarah young devotion the angels watch over you it's not by accident i love angels i'm glad they're god's agents to protect us and watch over us and minister to us and i want to share in this brief time that we have of how they can minister to us and how they ministered to Christ and how they can minister to you and I. Well, the, just a couple of questions. Let's, let's go over a couple of questions. The first one would be, you know, how many angels are recorded? In the, I mean, how many angels are there? Well, Hebrews 12, 22 says this. No, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to countless thousands of angels in a, in a joyous, joyous gathering. So, let's just say they're innumerable. We really don't know how many angels there are. It's not listed. We know it goes into the millions and millions and millions and millions. There's two kinds of angels. There's fallen angels and the unfallen angels. Now the unfallen angel, of course, the one great angel, you know, highest angel in heaven was Satan. And God kicked him out. Isaiah 14, cast him to the earth. He threw his followers. A third of those angels went with Satan. God booted him out of heaven. I was trying to encourage a pastor once and he was really down you know, he had lost people at his church, a few people. And I said, buddy, <clears throat> God's perfect, right? Yes, he is. He's the creator of the universe. Yes, yes. He lost a third of heaven. He lost a third of his church. <laughs> Sent him to hell. So don't feel bad. Don't feel bad. You know, and we, we respect his power. Satan I'm talking about. I love what Charles Swindoll said because, you know, in this culture, there's a lot of Talk about demons and demon activity. 
And Charles Wendell, the great author, the great pastor, the great president of Dallas Theological Seminary, said this, know that demons exist, leave them alone. Just leave them alone. I'm going to tell you at the end of this message, the great Michael, the archangel, what he said about Satan. But I want to go with those unfallen angels. I want to go with the good guys. Amen? I like those good guys. Well, do angels, here's another question, do they dwell among us? Yes, they do. It's possible, it's possible that every one of us in this room, we have encountered an angel at one time or another, and we haven't even realized it. We didn't know that we are encountering an angel. Hebrews 13, verse 2 says this. Don't forget to show hospitality now remember that word right there to strangers for some who have done this have entertained don't forget that word angels without realizing it well that's a that's a that's a wild verse right there i love it um the word hospitality that's to receive guests uh, with a warm reception a warm reception that's why and and johnny you your director of welcoming committee and we have the best welcoming people out there to make people feel welcome we really do great job because we never know what people have encountered through the week and the last place they need you know is they need encouragement and love and uh, and so all of you who uh, greet people when they come in thank you thank you that's a very very important important job and uh we have you know we've had our church family you know people have gone through some some real tragedies this week and so you know they they come to church and they're they're you know they're encouraged and i don't mind saying it and i'm sure he won't mind me saying it and uh but gary rubel i'm glad you're here this morning god bless you god bless you and I know physically he's really been going through it. We've been praying. And he comes in here and, you know, he can be encouraged. You can let him know, hey, I'm praying for you. You know, praying for you. And so people need encouragement. So that's where that hospitality comes. Entertaining is really, it's receiving a guest, but it's with anticipation. It's with anticipation. Have you ever talked to somebody and, uh, you know, you can tell by the countenance in their face, they're just not having a really good day or they haven't had it and we don't know somebody could have lost their job they could have found out from the doctor things are so we have no idea but you can tell and that's by entertaining you say how are you how are you feeling what can I do for you you know we don't know, we don't know. are there any angels in here would you just lift your hand if there's an angel in here Thank you. It was right there. I knew it. You remember that old song by Elvis? She looks like an angel, but it's the devil in disguise. Right there he is. <laughs> you set me up. I couldn't help it. <laughs> that was good, wasn't it, Nate? <clears throat> well, so when you look for angels in Scripture, of course, you'll do a word search. Anytime you do a study on a word or you do a study uh, about a, you know, some, uh, you know, something that you want to study, maybe it's a doctrine of the Bible or it's, you know, you take a, a word like we heard, fear, take your, you, you do a study on fear. Well, you know, so I'm taking this word angel and it shows up in Daniel chapter 7. And, but <clears throat> to study about what you're studying about, you take the whole chapter into consideration. You take the context, the content of the story without taking, you know, a, away from the story to fit my own personal feeling about that. It's exactly what it says, and so you study about that. So you get to Daniel chapter 7. Wow, what an interesting chapter that is. Uh, Daniel chapter 7. Daniel has this dream, and in the dream he has this vision that God gives to him. And so Daniel 7 and verse 2, 
In my vision that night, I, Daniel, saw a great storm churning the surface of a great sea with strong winds blowing from every direction. Now, the first six chapters, the first six books of Daniel, the first six chapters, are historical in content with, of course, some prophecy, uh, you know, throughout the chapters that you can extract from those chapters. But when you get to chapter 7, you know, it is it's prophetic uh, as, it, as, as it lays out, you know, in these passages and in this book of Daniel. And so Daniel has this vision. And in chapter 7, verse 3, this is what he encounters. And then four huge beasts come up out of the water, each different from the others. Now, do we have that picture of those four beasts that come up from out of the water? Okay, let me take these one at a time. If Sister Beth will leave this up here. Uh, the lion is the first one that he encounters uh, with, with eagle's wings. With eagle's wings. And this lion, to prophecy, is going to represent a modern day... Uh, Iraq, modern day Turkey, modern day Syria, as God is putting prophet, prophetically all this together, and we're going back 900 plus years. And what happens to the lion with that eagle's wings, uh, the significance about that is that God plucks, God plucks the eagle's wings that are attached to the lion. What's that? That means this. Don't mess with my nation. <laughs> Don't mess with Israel. Don't mess with my chosen people. Right? Okay, and then the second beast is bear. The bear, he comes out. He represents representative of 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 turkey and then you have the third one this leopard with all these heads on it and uh, there's representation here of iran uh, modern day iran and then you get to this dinosaur the fourth beast man can you imagine that dream wow daniel waking up what did i have to eat last night but you know he has this fourth beast show up out of the water in this dream, this God-given vision, this God-given dream. And that's representative uh, of, of Italy and, and France, modern-day Germany and, and Asia and uh, Egypt and, and Turkey and some uh, teachers of prophecy will say the rise of the Roman Empire. But the encouraging thing about all this and this dream is that God is the judge. God is the judge. And God is going to judge. And look what God says. Psalm 37, verse 13. The writer says, but the Lord just laughs, for he sees their day of judgment coming. Huh? Can you be encouraged by that? I can. I can be encouraged. Do you know what we are witnessing? We are witnessing this very thing right now in this world. Right now, we're seeing the armies, some of those nations that I just mentioned to you. World dominance, Russia moving into Ukraine, China and Russia making an alliance together. Iran and Russia under the table making an alliance. You're seeing the armies of the north, exactly what God said in prophecy would happen, starting to make their move. And they have their focus and all their attention on the little nation of Israel. But in Daniel chapter 7, verse 9 and 10, and then I get to the angel part when we're talking about... Um, how many angels there are. I watched as thrones were put in place and the ancient one sat down to judge. His clothing was as white as snow, his hair like purest wool. He sat on a fiery throne with wheels of blazing fire. 
and a river of fire was pouring out, flowing from his presence, and millions of angels ministered to him. Many millions stood to attend him. Wow. Okay, let me just, here's another interpretation of this. God says this, if you want to get to my people, you got to go through me. If you want to get to my people, you got to go. And guess what? If you're a child of God, you're his people. You've been grafted into the nation of Israel. You have been grafted into the Jewish lineage. You are a part of the Jewish Savior, Jesus Christ. And God says to the enemy, if you want to get to him, if you want to get to her, you got to come through me. You got to come through me. Now, I don't remember much about this story, but I do remember when I was, oh, I was, uh, I, I would have been at about the second grade or the third grade, and uh, I, I would walk to school. I remember the house, it's, it was on 7th, 14th Street, South 14th Street in Richmond. And it was only about a block, and I would walk to school uh, every day. I remember this one particular time when I walked, I don't, I don't remember what this guy said to me. I just remember he was bigger than I was. And I remember looking up at him. And he was trying to intimidate. I don't remember if he tried to take my lunch money. I don't remember if he pushed me. He didn't put his hands on me. I just remember that I was afraid. And, you know, it's so long ago. Don't remember the words that he said. I don't remember what I said. I don't think I said anything. I just stood there and looked at him. But I do remember this. I remember from behind him was my brother, my older brother. And, he, and you know, I don't remember what my brother said. I don't remember what my brother did. I just know that the fear left me. I know that a boldness came over me. And at the time, I don't know, I've, I've never seen the guy again, ever, ever. My brother could have buried him in the backyard. For all I know, I don't know. <laughs> I just know of the feeling that I had. You know, and... I'll say this, I don't know what my brother said, but I know what Jesus said. Jesus said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. Isaiah said he's behind us, he's beside us on both sides, he guides us, he's over us, he's under us, he's all around us, just as Psalm 91 says, his angels circle us. They're around us. God's agents, God's angels his ministering angels, his military angels, his serving angels, his watching angel. The most popular angel in Scripture would probably be Gabriel. Gabriel's name means hero of God. He was the principal messenger of God. And he would take messages. For instance, in Daniel 8, kind of concluding what we were talking about in Daniel, verse 16 and 17, I heard a human voice, Daniel says, calling from the Uliah River, Gabriel, tell this man the meaning of his vision. As Gabriel approached the place where I was standing, I became so terrified that I fell with my face to the ground. Son of man, the angel said, you must understand that the events you have seen in your vision relate to the time of the end. So when you're reading Daniel, you know, you're reading prophecy. You're, re you're reading things to come, things that are going to take place. And it's very up to date, and it is up to date, and it's today's news. And then about eight or nine hundred years later, Gabriel once again he gives another message that is given to him from God to give to Zechariah. Luke 1, verse 18 and 19. Zechariah said to the angel, how can I be sure this will happen? They're up in age, Zechariah and Elizabeth. I'm an old man now, and my wife is also along in years. Then the angel said, I am Gabriel. I stand in the very presence of God. It was he who who sent me to bring you this good news. Elizabeth was pregnant, and who was she pregnant with? John the Baptist. The way, the man who was going to prepare the way for the Lamb of God to give the message. 
And then Gabriel delivered another message as the hero of God, as the angel of God. And it's in Luke 1, 28 through 33. Gabriel appeared to her, Mary, and said, Greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will, bring very, he will be very great and will be called the Son of Man Most High. The Lord will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. And his, I love this part. You want to read this with me? This is great right here. You ready? Because you're a part of this kingdom. His kingdom will never end. Read it again. His kingdom will never end. Praise God. Praise the Lord. And then there are angels who are unseen. Unseen angels. Really the only two names that we have, of, according to scripture, uh, names of angel is Gabriel and Michael, the archangel. But you have a lot of angels at work. Boy, we see millions and millions of millions and hundreds of thousands and a lot of angels at work, but a lot of them aren't named. None of them. Love this passage of Scripture, Acts 12, uh, verses 1 through 11. About that time, King Herod Agrippa began to persecute some believers in the church. He had the apostle James, John's brother, killed with a sword. When Herod saw how much this pleased the Jewish people, he also arrested Peter. And this took place, in parentheses, during the time of Passover. Then he imprisoned him, placing him under the guard of four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring Peter out in public trial after the Passover. But while Peter was in prison, the church prayed. Oh, this is very important right here, y'all. The church prayed earnestly for him. Next week, we're going to do Encountering God Through Prayer. <clears throat> that night before Peter was placed on trial, he was asleep, fastened with two chains between two soldiers. Others stood guard at the prison gate. Suddenly there was a bright light in the cell, and the angel of the Lord stood before Peter. The angel struck him on the side to awaken him and said, get up. And the chains fell off his wrist. He's not going to court tomorrow. he would probably get a citation for that as well. Then the angel told him, get dressed and put on your sandals, and he did. Now put on your coat and follow me, the angel ordered. So Peter left the cell following the angel, but all the time he thought it was a vision. He didn't realize it was actually happening. You ever been there? I can't believe this is happening. I can't believe this. He passed the first and second guard posts, and then he came to an iron gate leading into the city, and opened. they opened by themselves. <laughs> that was even before any kind of chip. So they passed through and started walking down the street, and the angel suddenly left him. Peter finally came to a sentence. It's really true, he said. The Lord has sent his angel to save me from Herod and from what the Jewish leaders had planned to do with me. Here's verse 10. Verse 10 says, right here, they passed the first and second guard post. This is the one that caught my attention, Johnny. And came to the iron gate leading to the city, opening the walls. Blah, 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 blah. So they passed through. Blah, blah, blah. And then the angel suddenly left him. Hmm. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit never leaves us. This is before the Holy Spirit, I know, came, but the Holy Spirit was there. But the indwelling of the believer was not until the upper room experience. But the angel, the angel left him. I'm so thankful for the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit empowers us and he fills us. And I know there are times that you don't feel so filled. We sin. The Bible says we grieve the Spirit. We grieve the Spirit, but the Spirit is there. The Spirit will never leave us. We are eternally secure. Amen? Eternally secure in God. Wow, the Holy Spirit, God above me, God below me, God beside me, God behind me, God in front of me, millions of angels. Man, what more could a child of God ask for? These unnamed angels, I love the story of... 1 Kings 19, Elijah, 5 and through 8. Then he laid down and slept under the broom tree. 
But as he was sleeping, the angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. He looked around and beside his head was some bread baked. Angels can cook. They can cook. They're baking bread. Man, I bet it's good. Hot stones. Don't that sound good? Man, that's something that the cooking channel couldn't even touch right there. Bread baked on hot stones. No way. They got all these cookers and all this. You got hot stones right there, and there's bread just sizzling, sizzling on that. It's warming, not sizzling. And, and a jar of water. Ooh, he ate and drank and laid down again. Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, get up and eat some more. He knew he needed more, more food. Or the journey ahead will be too much for you. So it's okay to eat, y'all. Need that strength. So he got up, he ate and drank, and the food gave him enough strength to travel for 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. Hmm. And then there was Gethsemane. The angel came and ministered to Jesus. Luke 22, 43 and 44. Then the angel from heaven appeared, listen, and strengthened him. The Son of God strengthened him. He prayed more fervently. And he was in such agony of spirit that his sweat fell to the ground like drops of blood. Mm. This was really the beginning. Gethsemane would lead to Calvary. And Jesus said, Father, if it be your will, this is very important, listen. If it be your will, let this cup pass from me. Now listen. This is the beginning of the darkest hour that Christ ever experienced on this earth. And in his darkest hour, an angel came and ministered to him. Now it's in Matthew 4, at the beginning of his ministry, Matthew 4, verse 10 and 11 says this, Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him, for the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil went away, and angels came and took care of Jesus. They ministered to him. Okay, there's two things. This is what I want. I want angels to minister to me. You want angels to minister to you. I find two things in reading those passages. The first one is, of course, we're heirs of Jesus Christ. We're heirs of salvation. We're partakers of his blood. So we have Jesus Christ in us through the presence and the power of his Holy Spirit. I remember an old song on a quartet you sing. It's a song the angels, I think you all sang that with the rhythm masters. It's a song the angels cannot sing. Amazing grace. You know, they weren't redeemed, we're redeemed. So we're heirs of salvation. The second one is something that we covered um, in encountering God through our actions and it's obedience obedience Jesus was obedient when he began his ministry and in going into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights without eat he was obedient to the father and then he was obedient when John the Baptist baptized him that's why it's the first step of obedience for a child of God who's asked Christ to come into their lives. Their first step of obedience is to follow him in baptism by showing the public, hey, I've been saved and I want to follow Jesus. You're being obedient. You're being obedient. Jesus was obedient in Gethsemane. Jesus was obedient uh, at Calvary. Jesus was obedient to the Father. And remember, we said this a few weeks ago. It's better to obey than to sacrifice. We want these angels of God to minister to. Somebody would say, 
And I, I've had this, said Johnny and I experienced this a few years ago. Uh, you know, when a, uh, a, a teenage girl and her mom said, would you guys come to my house there in, in Lebanon? And we prayed. She was experiencing some dark activity, some demonic activity. And, uh, you know, basically what we said was, you know, what you know, are you bringing into this room? What is it that you're bringing into this room? You know, are you giving, you know, entrance? Satan, you know, he's not like God. He's not omnipresent. But, you know, he can be places. And when we as children of God, we know he cannot possess us, but he sure can oppress us. And when we give him that inch, he takes a mile. Because I just had someone tell me a few weeks ago, hey, I've got this going on in my life. And I said, you know, here's what we do take an inventory to see what's going on you know it's like David he said this is what I told this person you know search me oh God and know my ways know him know my heart if I'm experiencing this oppression and I want God's angels to minister to me I've got to Lord what's going on what what should what am I getting too close to this am I Lord help me protect me watch over me let me not do the things that would grieve the spirit I want the angels of God to minister to me I want his spirit to fill me Psalm 34 verse 7 says this if you honor the Lord his angel will protect you but that that's a promise there's the premise if you honor the Lord and then You've honored the Lord with your life, and the end of life, his angels will take you to heaven. Luke 16, verse 22. Finally, the poor man died and was carried by the angels to sit beside Abraham at the heavenly banquet, and the rich man also died and was buried. Well, I, I got one more verse I'm going to give to you, but I do want to talk about just real quick. Michael, the archangel. He's the highest ranking angel. And uh, boy, he's going to be a part of those last days. And, uh, you know, he mentions Michael the archangel. And I don't have it in note, but it's if you'd like to make a mental note or write it down, it's Jude. And there's only one chapter in the book of Jude before Revelation. And it's verse 9. When there was a dispute between Satan and Michael the archangel. And they were arguing over the mo body of Moses. Well, man, he'd been gone. What's going on? <laughs> Satan probably worried he'd come back again. <laughs> you know, he doesn't know everything and doesn't know anything about what God's up to. But here's what Michael the archangel said. Hey, I respect his power. And if Michael the archangel, because you know what? You can't do anything on your own. Jesus said, hey, get behind me, Satan. He defeated Satan with the word of God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. It has to be with the word of God. I can't stand in my own power and say, Satan, give me. No, I have to have the power of Jesus Christ, the filling of Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ all over me before I even stand and think. I can't do this on my own because you know what Ephesians says there are principalities of we don't wrestle against flesh and blood but we wrestle against principalities things that we cannot see and God's at work he's above us he's below us he's beside us he's around us he's all over and his angels encircle us Michael the archangel one day when God gives that word 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 16 come on with this for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout and the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of the call of God, first believers who have died will rise from their graves. Boom! Grave robber. We'll be gone. Hey, how about that? Both them pilots, you know, somebody better be unsaved flying that plane. They, that was a dumb thing to say. Both of them better be saved. You know what I mean? Who's flying the plane? Isn't God good? Are you ready for that day? Come on, let's stand. Can I do something a little different? Beth, we were going to sing this song, Turn Your Eyes, but I feel compelled about doing this song. Let's do I Come to the Garden, okay? 
I love this song. Let's do it.